How high? That is the question today. How high? Not how high I am, because frankly, I think we all know the answer to that, but how high should your energy level be on an approach? When you're going up to meet somebody you've never met before, you're walking up to them, how high should your energy level be relative to theirs? So this is a question that I got asked on my free seven day charisma mastery challenge group on Facebook. And if you wanna be a part of that group, it's free as I just said, just go on Facebook and search for those wonderful words, seven day charisma mastery challenge, and you too can be a part of all the magic that's going on there, all of the epiphanies, all the wonderful learnings, and it's totally free, so check it out. But anyway, someone asked me that question, how high should your energy level be on an approach? Well, I told this guy this, I said, look, the conventional wisdom is that it should be slightly higher than theirs. In other words, you want to think of it like you're, you're adding energy to the interaction as opposed to leeching energy off of it. And one thing that I always tell clients, you know, on the live programs, I say, look, tonight I want you to look at all of your interactions through the following lens, if you will. Am I A, am I trying to weasel my way into their party? Like the people are there having fun and I go up to their group and I'm like just, you know, lurking along the periphery and then I kind of, I say, excuse me, ladies, may I, may I join the fun? <laughs> In fact, if you said it like that, it, it'd probably have a better chance of working than if you were just going up and that was your actual, <laughs> your actual internal dialogue or, or essentially your internal demeanor. So are you doing that? Again, trying to weasel your way into their party or are you B, already having fun in the environment and then you're bringing that party to them okay key key distinction anytime it's the former in my vast experience it's not likely to get a very good reaction whereas the latter has a much better track record of people being receptive to that kind of approach now when i said this someone piped up with a, a little bit of a counterpoint and you know it was, it was a good counterpoint he said, actually, it should be slightly lower. The person who's kind of the, the calmest guy in the room is always going to be perceived in a better light than the guy who's kind of bouncing all over the place and, and you know, this kind of goofy, <laughs> you know, this, this guy who's kind of trying to, you know, like almost compensate through use of this higher energy level. And look, I understand where that guy's coming from. However, I think that it's a pretty co a common misunderstanding when it comes to this idea of energy, okay? Because what's the, the misunderstanding in this case is I believe that this individual, he was mistaking energy or uh, mistakenly equating energy level with intensity, okay? So you can go in there and you can have a slightly higher level of energy than them, the people you're approaching, but simultaneously be calmer, right? You can be expressing or allowing a greater amount of physiological, psychological, or emotional energy to be radiating out through your, your being, through the, the, you know, the, your voice, your face, your body, and still be calmer in your demeanor. And they're still going to be able to sense that energy, right? Because you radiate that energy from your eye contact, from your attention on them, your level of engagement, your presence, that your movement through space, right? It's per, it, it really sort of just reeks out of your pores, if you will, right? It, it, it sort of, so it's suffused through your entire being. And how can they tell this? Well, ultimately, they'll be able to tell this because they can sense there's a freedom from tension in your communication, even though it seems a little bit calmer. It, it, it's lacking that tension that characterizes, you know, people who have, who are stifled or who are struggling or coping. So essentially, again, there's this freedom from tension, whereas the person who's incapable of projecting that energy without having to struggle through these various internal blocks that they have, it's going to be very, very obvious that they're stifled. How? Through all of those means that I just listed, through the face, the voice, the body language, the eye contact, the movement through space, they're going to be obviously stifled. So the key takeaway here is energy does not equal intensity. You can have that slightly higher level of energy and still be calm. And this is why I can go up to someone with you know, just an extended hand and maybe a raised eyebrow and I can get pretty consistently good reactions from that. Because 
even though there's not a lot of overt action taking place in my behavior, what action that I am exhibiting is coming from a place of power, right? Not from a place of tension entanglement, uh, you know, resulting from these various inner blocks. So uh, again, once you, like, and I'm always talking about in my programs, both in my CM Digital and my mentoring program, a big takeaway is tension is the enemy. That's kind of like one of the overarching themes of all of this stuff. When I started to investigate what is preventing these people that I teach, these clients that I teach, who have a deep familiarity with technique, but an inability to create a compelling vibe that captures their attention, right? What's going on there? What's going on there? What's causing this? And how can I fix this? How, can, how do I teach somebody how to vibe, essentially? So how, basically what it came down to as I investigated this further over the, uh, you know, the past several years now was that it's largely physical tension blocks resulting from intellectual judgment, right? Intellect deems that there's about to be a change in the quantity or quality of energy going out through the face, voice, and body, or quali uh, the quality of emotional energy. And again, the, the quality of the emotion really isn't an, an issue here, whether it's positive or negative. Generally, we're conditioned to believe that emotional expression is potentially dangerous. So as soon as the impulse to express the emotion comes out, intellect clamps down on it with some kind of interference control pattern, which typically means physical tension. And these physical tension blocks are largely below your threshold of awareness because you've been practicing them for decades most of the time. And as such, you've begun to equate the repression of energy with its expression. Since those two events, the impulse to express and the impulse to repress happen almost as the same moment in time. Okay. So ultimately when we're talking about, you know, do I want to be, do I want to be, uh, you know, expressed with a lot of energy or do I want to be come from a place of more repose? Ultimately, this is a question of reconciling opposites. And there are many such opposites that need to be reconciled in this area of social interaction. You know, for example, one of the, the biggest ones is this idea of vibe versus plot development, right? Vertical lyric or vibe expansion versus moving things forward and moving it along your, your planned plot development, whether that's negotiation, closing sales, getting romantic with someone you just met, doesn't matter. When you're vibing, when you're creating that vibe, right? What is vibe? Vibe is just good feelings. So the person that you're interacting was like, dude, I like this. This is fascinating. This is compelling. This is interesting. This is shocking. This is hilarious. Whatever it is, this, my attention should be here, right? And if you cannot generate a vibe, it doesn't matter how, again, how great of a grasp you have on technique. If you can't get them to look here, it, it, it doesn't matter. You're not going to have the time. They're not going to pay enough attention to allow you the time necessary to move it forward. So the thing about vibing though, when, when you're vibing, ideas don't progress horizontally in this linear fashion from logical idea to logical idea. They just kind of expand on the ideas vertically and the feelings vertically, right? Um, and so really, you know, you've got to kind of find the vibe implicit in the plot development and the plot development implicit in the vibe. Okay. What's another set of opposites, reason and logic versus feeling and emotion, right? Memorization of stories or different, uh, you know, conversational threads versus improvisation and letting go. Self-confidence versus self-analysis, seriousness versus playfulness, discipline versus freedom, carefulness versus recklessness. And of course, repose versus energy like we're talking about right now. So when you're looking at these opposites to be reconciled, you gotta understand the greatest vitality at any point along a spectrum of energy, so to speak, is through the interaction of the opposites that form that spectrum. So again, you wanna find the plot development inherent in the vibe and the vibe inherent in the plot development. Again, rise above it. Don't cling to these like dualistic oppositions. Don't cling to one or the other. Repose or energy, it's gotta be one or the other, right? Find that synthesis. Now, this, this whole uh, debate or question, it also brings to mind the, I guess you might call what you might call the power of intrigue or the power of mystery. And this is something that's really fascinating to me because if you expand your expressive skills, if you expand your expressive capacity, and by the way, understand that in my teachings, I'm not trying to change behavioral choice, right? That's a big thing. Back in the day, I, I, I kind of did, to be, to be fair. I was like, this is the way, this is what you need to do and say to get the good result. But look, everyone's different and, and you know, people are going to gravitate towards different approaches and there's tons of ways to skin a cat, so to speak. So I'm no longer trying to change behavioral 
choice. I'm trying to change behavioral capacity, right? The ability to do anything you want with your face, your voice, your body, right? You expand that capacity and if you get that range, that dynamic range of language musicality and facial expressiveness and gesture and along with getting a, you know, a certain mastery of all the internal factors that go into it, then you don't need to actually approach the limits in actual performance or interaction, right? What, what, do I, what am I talking about there? Like you, you get the ability to do whatever you want with your face or voice. And, you know, in an actual performance, whether it's singing, whether it's giving a speech, whether it's, again, talking to someone you met at a bar, if those people that you're interacting with or performing for never see you stretch or approach your limits, they might think that you're capable of anything. Whereas if they can see, you know, you kind of reaching the limit, like you exerting yourself, you're like, you know, you're trying to hit that high note and it looks like you're kind of struggling. They're like, oh, okay, that, that's the limit. That's where, that's where his limit is. And then that spell is broken, right? So it, look, Here's a saying that I really love. In exercise, practice what you can't do, and in performance, allow what you can when appropriate. And like I said earlier, in a moment ago, ultimately it's not about you know, changing or, or dictating your behavioral choice, like this is the best way to approach it, but rather expanding your behavioral capacity, all right? Now, as I said before, you, you, high energy can work, low energy can work too, but only if it's coming from a place of power. And how do you do that? How do you express low energy from a place of power? Well, you do that, it's quite, well, it's not simple. It's pretty straightforward. You change those default entanglements, right? From necessities into choices. So in other words, you know, you might have somebody who's stifled. They got a deadpan face, inexpressive body language, voice is kind of meek and stifled. And if you train that, like if that person goes up, it's very, again, it's very obvious that this, is not a choice they're making. It's very obvious that they have to do this because of these tension blocks that, as we said a moment ago, result from negative social conditioning that lead to judgmentalism and ultimately these tension, tension via these control interference patterns. It's very obvious that they're stifled, right? Whereas, you know, you look at somebody who has learned to expand those capabilities. If they're making a choice in the moment, to kind of have a more relaxed face, more relaxed body language, kind of be more low key, they can tell that that's a proactive decision on their part to act to kind of be more chilled out. And at any moment they could bust out like Haruken or like Shoryuken, like they could bust out some crazy shit. So you learn how to fight so you don't have to. So these tension blocks, like we said before, you know, the basic controlling patterns like this, intellect perceives an impulse to express more energy or more emotion and it immediately just shuts it down with those interference control patterns right the result is that inexpressive face tense body language poor eye contact and just what just a shit vibe right that's not compelling now on that same thread a third person brought up a different viewpoint and they said well you know what energy level should you be expressing out when you approach whatever is congruent for you at the moment like whatever's congruent for you at the moment just go up like that and look, I, I'll admit, yes, there is a great power in authenticity. However, sometimes whatever's congruent for you at the moment fucking sucks. It just sucks for the situation. And so it would behoove you to learn to expand your expressive capability as much as you can. I mean, look, bottom line, we live in a society with other people. That's just how our civilization is organized. We're social creatures. And what that means is that how well you're doing in literally every area of your life, whether it's business, social, whatever, that's dictated by the quality of your relationships with other people. And in all honesty, I truly believe that the ability to communicate with power is the number one skill that everyone watching this could improve right now to see immediate quantifiable improvements in your actual day-to-day -day existence. So the curriculum in my Charisma Mentoring Program, it's based on my real world experience, coaching social dynamics, live in the field, okay, in the real world, not just in some seminar room, and I've been doing that for 18 years. And in this eight week VIP private group, I cover face, voice, and body language training. I cover inner game work on the intellect, opening to intuitive capacities, working with the inner emotional process and understanding how that functions as you interact with people. I cover a vast array of in-depth conversational tactics and techniques for those of you who like tactics and techniques. I cover persuasive ability. I cover conflict communication. And ultimately I cover leadership abilities as well. 
So with this mentoring program, I believe that the support that you're getting in this program is really what sets it apart. A lot of my clients have kind of come to this program really at the end of the rope. You know, they've gone through a lot of other programs and they really didn't see lasting results. But what makes this different is that with the 24 seven support that you're getting, with the accountability of the group, again, I hold you accountable for doing the missions every single week, and then twice a week, you get personal calls with myself and my team, and these aren't some little BS calls. I'll be on these calls for two, three, three and a half hours. The call lasts as long as it needs to until I've determined that you've gotten what you need until the next call, right? With all of that, these clients, they actually end up having breakthroughs like they've never had before. So there's a couple spots left in this private mentoring group. And all you got to do is hit the link in my bio or in the description below, charismamentoring.com. Very easy to remember. You're going to apply. Okay. You've got to apply because I don't want kooks. I don't want weirdos. I don't want dabblers here. Go to charismamentoring.com, short little application, book a free discovery call with an expert from my team. And then you're going to get that 24 seven accountability and personal communication and support. That's going to make all the difference. Look, Life gives you an opportunity. You take that opportunity, you'll have a beautiful life. So apply now and I'll see you in the group. This program is designed to give you a process to open and sustain charismatic expression with increasing consistency. Remove the obstacles, isolate the skills, exercise them separately, then put them together in a more completely realized whole. How to speak to all the issues surrounding this inner relationship between intuitive and intellectual resources is arguably the most fundamental challenge facing anyone who's attempting to improve their communication skills. So if you're looking to develop general charisma that you can apply across all areas of life, definitely check out Jeff's Charisma Mastery.